Good morning and welcome to FIDA One at the 2021 Virtual African Bird Fair. Thanks to our CEO, Mark Anderson, for his welcome address just before this session. And a big thank you to our platinum sponsors, MSC Cruises, Ital Tal, the AA, Ford Wildlife Foundation and Zeiss South Africa for making this exciting event possible. Coming up next, our first series of lectures will be presented by the staff and students of the Fitzpatrick Institute for African Ornithology from the University of Cape Town and they will be sharing their exciting research from across the continent with all of you. As BirdLife South Africa, we are extremely grateful to the Fitzpatrick Institute for the impeccable service they provide in training top-class ornithologists, several of whom who have found their way to working for BirdLife South Africa, as well as for the fantastic research they produce, which assists the conservation world in better understanding the diverse species we are trying to preserve and protect. I'll now hand over to the Institute team to share their exciting work with all of us. Enjoy everybody. Welcome to the African Bird Fair. I'm Peter Ryan, director of the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology. Africa is renowned as being the cradle of humankind and is unique in being the only continent with a mostly intact megafaunal community. This is because Africa was largely spared the mass extinction of large animals that accompanied the spread of hominids out of Africa. Africa also boasts an impressive diversity of birds. One quarter of all birds occur in Africa and its adjacent islands, with close to 2,000 species found nowhere else. In addition to this high level of species richness, Africa also is home to 27 endemic bird families, more than 10% of all families. And three of 40 bird orders are found nowhere else on Earth. In order to effectively conserve this rich avian heritage, we need to understand how African birds are coping in the face of unprecedented global change. This is the main goal of the Fitzpatrick Institute at the University of Cape Town. Established in 1960 by Dr. Cecily Niven to commemorate her father, Sir Percy Fitzpatrick, the author of Jock of the Bushveld, the Fitzinstitute is recognized as a national center of excellence using birds as keys to biodiversity conservation. Our research focuses on understanding and conserving biodiversity, and one of our flagship courses is the Conservation Biology MSc program, which has been training the next generation of conservation leaders from all over the world for the past 30 years. Today, 10 of our students will present aspects of their research, which will give you a flavor of the wide range of topics covered at the FITS. I'm sure you'll find them interesting. If you'd like to learn more about our research, please visit our website and download copies of our informative annual reports. Hello, I'm Jess Lund and I study species interactions of African birds, particularly those between brood parasites and their hosts. Um, I'm a PhD student in Claire Spottiswood's group and I'm currently based at Cambridge, but I did my master's at the FITS and that's the work that I'm going to be talking about today. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about perfect cheats and the remarkable arms race between forktail drongos and African cuckoos. Uh, so to investigate this arms race, I'm going to take you to the battlefield here in the idyllic Miombo woodland of Zambia in spring and introduce you to the antagonists. So African cuckoos are brood parasites that lay their eggs in the nests of forktail drongo hosts. And then when the cuckoo egg hatches, it ejects all the drongo eggs from the nest and monopolizes food provisioning. And this is obviously very costly to drongos, but they're not helpless. And they're able to recognize and reject dissimilar eggs from the nest. But in response to the selection, African cuckoos have evolved mimicry to trick drongos into accepting the cuckoo egg as one of their own. And then the next step in this arms race is the diversification of drongo egg signatures. So just as we have signatures that identify us, so individual drongos lay a fixed egg type throughout their life and they can use this egg phenotype as a signature of their identity. So these clutches here give you some idea of the diversity of drongo egg signatures. But as we know, signatures can be forged and in each of these clutches, there is a cuckoo egg. And from these naturally parasitized clutches, you can really appreciate the accuracy of the mimicry. And this is interesting because in most mimicry systems, there'll be some consistent differences between host and parasite eggs. 
but to us in the field, this does not seem to be the case here. So could this be a rare instance of perfect mimicry? So first we wanted to look for population level differences in egg phenotype between the two species. So to do this, to quantify cuckoo and drongo egg phenotypes, we visited drongo nest at the study site near Choma in Zambia, and we measured drongo and cuckoo egg color using spectrophotometry and uh, pattern using image analysis of the photographs we took of those eggs. So does cuckoo eggshell, does eggshell color and pattern differ between cuckoos and drongos? So here we have a uh, few examples of drongo eggs. Each egg here is laid by a different female. And here on the left are the cuckoo eggs. And these eggs are all to scale and it really highlights how accurate the mimicry is here. And from our analysis of color and pattern, we found no difference in eggshell color, uh, but that on average, there was a small difference in one pattern measure, pattern coverage. So mimicry is almost perfect in the system, but what does this mean for drongos and cuckoos? Specifically, how often will a cuckoo egg escape rejection by drongos? So first we needed to investigate how drongos were discriminating against dissimilar eggs in their nests. And to do this, we performed egg rejection experiments, which involved removing a drongo egg from a clutch, uh, replacing it with a drongo egg from a different nest. So this egg is our surrogate for a cuckoo egg. And we then monitor whether the drongo accepts or rejects the egg. And in this experiment, despite the foreign egg um, being a very good match, the drongo recognized it was an imposter and removed it. And so we did about a hundred, over a hundred of these experiments and we found that drongos were highly accurate rejectors and they needed a very small difference in appearance to actually identify a cuckoo egg in the nest. And from these egg rejection experiments, we were also able to get a model of egg rejection, which we could then use um, to do some parasitism simulations on the computer to predict how often a cuckoo egg would escape rejection. And these simulations predicted that only 5.7% of parasitism events result in acceptance. And once we take into account the lifetime of African cuckoos, the number of eggs that they lay per year and the predation rate, these simulations predict that an African cuckoo female will fledge only two offspring per lifetime. And this is because cuckoos cannot preferentially parasitize certain egg types. So if you're a cuckoo which lays immaculate eggs, you will lay your eggs in whatever drongo nests are available but you'll probably only win and avoid rejection if you happen to lay in an immaculate clutch. So signatures work, um, but what does this mean for African cuckoos? Because if a female fledges only two chicks uh, a lifetime and not all those fledgings will even go on to reproduce themselves, this would make the population highly unstable because cuckoos aren't producing enough offspring to replace them generation to generation. And at the moment, this is still a mystery, um, how African cuckoos can persist as a fairly common species when their host, uh, at least here in Zambia, is such an efficient defender. Uh, so thank you all for listening. And that's the thing, thank you to, to Claire Spottiswood and the rest of the research group, all the field assistants, the amazing nest finders that make this work possible. They found all of the nests which we used in the study. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them in the Q&A, but also feel free to drop me an email. Uh, you can also visit our website, africancuckoos.com, where there's a lot of lot more information on our work, not only on African cuckoos, but also on brood parasites in Africa. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'll see you in a bit. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kaelin Padiachi, and today we'll be discussing temporal and spatial patterns of organochlorine pesticide analysis in raptors globally. This study forms part of a much larger project to understand the changes and patterns in OCP contamination throughout the world using birds of prey. For this presentation, we wanted to summarize existing knowledge on one of the most destructive and possibly most extensively studied OCPs in history, DDT. DDT is possibly one of the most notorious pesticide compounds ever created. And while its destructive impact on wildlife may be common knowledge, the origin of this compound may not be. DDT was first synthesized in 1874 by Austrian graduate student Ortmar Zeidler. However, it was only 66 years later, in 1939, that the extraordinary insecticidal properties of DDT were discovered by Swiss-born chemist Paul Müller. 
This discovery coincided with the start of World War II, which presented the perfect opportunity to make DDT's world debut. The powerful insecticide was implemented to protect thousands of soldiers against vector-borne diseases such as typhus and malaria, a task at which DDT was staggeringly effective and historically successful. With the end of the war in 1945, DDT became widely available to the public as an agricultural pesticide. However, it was during the 1940s that scientists first started voicing their concerns regarding the negative impacts DDT posed to the environment. Nevertheless, the role this compound played in saving lives during World War II earned Müller a Nobel Prize in 1948. Peak DDT use was reached between the 1960s and 1970s. However, 1962 saw a significant turning point in the way the public and scientific communities saw this miracle compound. Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, was published in 1962, sparking incredible public outcry and bringing the irrefutable danger posed by OCPs to the fore. As a result of the growing evidence, the United States banned DDT in, the in 1970. Most European countries soon followed the United States, banning DDT in the 1980s. 32 years after being banned in the Northern Hemisphere, the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, adopted by over 19 nations, came into force, restricting DDT in most parts of the world. This convention also restricted another 11 POPs, dubbing them the Dirty Dozen, due to their significant threat and persistence in the environment. Two years later, however, the World Health Organization decided to support and the reintroduction and use of DDT, specifically in certain tropical countries, to control vector-borne diseases, particularly malaria. This resulted in the legal production, distribution, and use of DDT in many Asian and African countries. It's evident from this timeline that DDT has long been impacting the environment, and its effect on organisms are well known, considered responsible for catastrophic declines in raptor populations across the globe in particular. However, it's important to note that several scientists believe that it was in fact the combined impact of both DDT and another one of the dirty dozen, dildren, that led to these dramatic declines in northern raptor populations. They postulate that DDT, specifically its metabolite DDE, induced significant egg shell thinning, resulting in reproductive failure. This reproductive failure was then exacerbated by mortality of adult birds due to dildren contamination, which further depressed population growth leading to significant declines in these populations over time. While pre-1960s and 70s population data on many northern hemisphere raptors in relation to OCP contamination is limited, there are some indications from populations during the time of DDT use, as well as after subsequent bans and restrictions. We see this in the study by Helander on white-tailed sea eagles. They show that the mean productivity in sea eagles increased as DDE concentrations in eggshells decreased. This was between 1965 and 2005. This is just one of hundreds of published studies since scientists first started investigating OCPs in raptors. Individual studies like this, covering a limited geographical region and only a few species at a time, while valuable, provide equally limited data. Hence the need and importance to consolidate all that we have discovered over the decades. Such an abundance of data has the potential to provide a substantial understanding surrounding DDT contamination in global raptor populations over a considerable time period. However, to do so requires a formal, structured method that can summarize and synthesize what has already been done and discovered so far. In order to accomplish this, we utilized a systematic review to search for, gather, and appraise relevant published studies on DDT and dildren and birds of prey from around the world. The aim of this review is simply to synthesize our current knowledge on these compounds in global raptor population. The process involved conducting a comprehensive search for published studies using specific keywords from all Web of Science databases. This provided a total of 405 potential studies which were then examined in full to determine which were most suitable for inclusion in this review. The inclusion criteria specified that DDT and or dildren concentrations must be analyzed in tissues of wild raptors and report descriptive statistics of these concentrations. The inclusion criteria narrowed down the studies to 257 from which the relevant data was then extracted. The preliminary analysis revealed that between 1901 and 2016, 34,039 individual raptors were sampled globally. It's important to note for the purposes of this study, we considered each egg sampled as an individual raptor. 
we found that the 34,039 raptors were sampled primarily from just two of the six continents represented in this review. In other words, 95% of all raptors sampled when investigating DDT and Dildra between 1901 and 2016 were sampled from North America and Europe. Furthermore, the 34,039 birds of prey sampled represented 130 raptor species. This graph represents the top 10 species commonly sampled globally. Europe and North America are represented by 9 and 7 of the 10 most commonly sampled species respectively. While not the most sampled species, the peregrine falcon is in fact sampled across all continents, albeit being sampled at considerably lower numbers in Africa, Asia, Oceania and South America. Samples from Europe appear to be dominated by the Eurasian sparrowhawk, with over 6,000 individuals sampled between 1901 and 2016. Surprisingly, peregrine falcons don't even feature in the top three most sampled species for this continent. In North America, on the other hand, samples, as expected, are dominated by bald eagles, with more than 7,000 individuals being sampled over the 115 years. Unlike Europe, however, peregrine falcons feature as the second most commonly sampled species in North America. So far, all this information confirms our initial hypothesis that the majority of data and the understanding around these OCPs and raptors, particularly DDT, are critically geographically limited. Besides the continents represented and species selected when assessing DDT and Dildren thus far, we were interested in understanding which tissues were analysed over the 115 year period. We found that the most commonly sampled raptor tissue was egg, with the oldest egg being assessed for DDT dating back to 1901, and the most recent sample being collected in 2013. This tissue, possibly not surprisingly, has been consistently sampled over the 115 years represented in this review, unlike other tissues which were only sampled regularly from around 1962. In fact, between 1901 and the early 1960s, eggs were the only raptor tissue being assessed for DDT and dildren. This graph shows six of the commonly sampled tissues including egg when assessing these OCPs globally. Liver was the second most common tissue sample, representing 9,248 samples, followed by plasma, 5,806, and brain at 1,500 samples. By consolidating 115 years of information on DDT in global raptors, we have uncovered considerable spatial knowledge gaps. The Northern Hemisphere, particularly Europe and North America, has received the majority of attention when it comes to OCPs and raptors. Current legislation and conventions have thus been largely geared from that perspective. However, the reintroduction of DDT in particular has been implemented in countries from continents that have comparatively less data on these OCPs and raptors. So with all that being said, could OCPs like DDT still pose a risk in the face of these strict global restrictions? Well, we know that India, for example, is still a significant producer and user of DDT, and was recorded using a staggering 3,092 metric tons of it in 2014, being responsible for 84% of global use during this period. India also exports DDT to countries in Africa and the rest of Asia, as both technical product and formulation. South Africa, for example, receives technical product and creates the DDT formulation for both local use and export to other African countries. In 2014, one other Asian country and seven African countries reported their DDT use. However, five more, while not formally reporting use, were recorded by independent data as having used DDT. It's important to note that all this information is from known data. It is still unclear how much DDT use goes unreported, particularly in Africa, Asia and South America. This is largely due to major shortcomings in national reporting procedures. All this information sparks a renewed urgency to assess OCPs in raptor populations from these lesser studied continents. So what's next for this research? Well, going forward with the study, we continue to consolidate and summarize known data from the 257 studies which make up this review, particularly data on dildren contamination and the temporal patterns surrounding these OCPs. Furthermore, we will be conducting a meta-analysis to statistically test changes in DDT and dildren in global raptor populations. In addition, we plan to test changes of these OCPs in eggs of global raptors as the most commonly sampled tissue for analyzing these compounds. Smith conducted a similar exercise for human breast milk with very interesting results. We aim to produce data and graphs similar to that, quantifying DDT and dildren concentrations both over time and space. 
Finally, we're making use of the Amor falcon carcasses from that catastrophic die-off that most of you may have heard about in 2019. This is meant to provide a more current assessment of OCPs and raptors. This should shed some light on the contamination of a migratory species which occur across both northern and southern hemispheres in countries currently using and or producing DDT in particular. Samples are currently being analyzed in Spain at UCLM's Institute for Game and Wildlife Research under the guidance of Dr. Rafael Mateo. And with that, I would like to thank all of you for attending this talk and to all the organizations and individuals that have made this study possible and continue supporting this project. Good day, everyone. My name is Timothy Kahn Akins from the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology, University of Cape Town. I am presenting on the topic Island of Fertility created by social weaver colonies and their host trees. Fertile vegetation island is typical of the arid environment and is characterized by high concentration of nutrients and the trees and shrubs. And this concentration of nutrients are formed through one the trapping of nutrients in erosion, particular wind erosion, and also attraction of diverse fauna to these trees because of the shade provided by the tree and also fruits. These animals in turn leave the African matter, which enhances the fertile vegetation island. These trees also attract animals for roosting and nesting as in the case of the social weaver. These social weavers in turn build huge nests from grasses and the grasses and the African matter enhances the fertile vegetation island. So in this case, or in this study, we test the hypothesis that the soil fertile vegetation island, soil fertility in the fertile vegetation island will vary with tree species, tree size, presence of nests, and colony size in the Kalahari environment. In this study, we sample soils from 23 shepherd trees and camelton trees, which are the main trees for nesting by the social weaver. We sample soils from the nest trees, which usually host the colony, and a control tree, which is of similar size and species to the nest tree. And in between these trees, in the grassland, we sample soil as the matrix site. So we have three sites, control, matrix site, and the nest site. These soils were analyzed for soil nutrients in the lab. And our result is going to be in three sessions. The first session will look at three species and special side effects on soil properties. And the results will be presented in these axis. We have on the X axis showing our treatments and the Y axis showing our response variable. Our first result shows that there was a significant in species and site interaction in response to the level of nitrogen in the soil. So we found out that there was high concentration of nitrogen and the camel thorn nests and shepherd nests as compared to their respective matrix and control sites. Similar trend could be seen for carbon, where we have higher concentration of carbon under Camerton nest and shepherd nest as compared to your respective control and matrix site. And control site recording significant higher as compared to matrix sites. We also look at the concentration of Delta 15N and Delta 13C under these soils. And we realize that there was higher level of Delta 15N under nest trees, which is an indication that the nitrogen we recorded in these soils are as a result of the introduction of nitrogen by the bears and not from the natural nitrogen fixation activities of that environment. Also, the carbon 13C or the Delta 13C component in the soil, especially under the nest soil, is an indication that the carbon is a combination from the nest grass materials in the tree. We also analyzed for minerals and we saw that there was high concentration of phosphorus under the nest trees as compared to the control and the matrix sites and this also varied with tree species. Similar trend could be said for calcium as well. We also analyzed for other soil properties other than the soil nutrients. And with soil pH, we saw that there was high concentration 
there was high soil pH under the nest trees as compared to the mattress and the contour side. And the mattress side had as a highly acidic soils as compared to the control and the nest sites. However, there was no significant difference in the water, soil water infiltration rates under the nests and the mattress and also the control for camel thorn. We also look at the tree size effect on soil properties and we found out that DBH significantly explained the variation in soil nitrogen and carbon. As the tree size increases, the level of nitrogen and carbon also increases, as seen in this diagram. We also look at the colony size effects on soil properties, and we found out that there was a positive relationship between the colony size and soil nitrogen and carbon for both species. And also, there was a negative relationship between colony size and calcium for Camerton tree whilst there was a positive relationship between colony size and magnesium for Camerton tree. With respect to soil water infiltration, there was a significant negative relationship for chambers or which is colony size and water infiltration rate. As the level, as the number of chambers increases, the water infiltration rate in these soils also decrease. So in conclusion, we can say that our island of fertility in the Kalahari environment is influenced by the tree species, the tree size, and the colony size. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I would like to acknowledge the support of my supervisors and the funders of this research. Thank you. Good day, everyone. My name is Benjamin Murphy. I'm a PhD student at the University of Cape Town as part of the Fitzpatrick Institute. And I'm going to talk to you guys about some aspects of my work studying forktail drongos in the Kalahari. Anthropogenic climate change is influencing environmental conditions globally and will impact biodiversity as air temperatures increase. Now, current predictions estimate an average global increase of two degrees Celsius in air temperature over the coming years. But it's worth remembering that environmental temperature increases will vary dependent on locality. Some information taken from the weather stations in the Kalahari and the Northern Cape show that the last decade there's been a rapid increase in numbers of days with air temperature above 40 degrees Celsius. This obviously is worrying, but it's also interesting because it means that the arid zone might be a perfect place to study the effects of climate change. Now, arid zones are characterized by hot and dry conditions with unpredictable water and food availability, meaning there's an inherently high stress load on individuals due to the greater resource cost of activity and survival. This means that species may already be at the edge of their physical threshold. This is concerning when we factor in that arid zones are predicted to undergo the most rapid increases in temperature in the coming years. And there's considerable concern that arid species already at the edge of their physical tolerance will be particularly badly affected. And it raises the question of whether species will be able to persist in the face of rising temperatures associated with climate change. Some of the previous research in the arid zone has focused on breeding in birds. Work by Dr. van der Feen on hornbills and by Duplessis on southern pied babblers show that individual birds decreased their activity as air temperature increased. Both foraging and provisioning activity decreased during hot periods, which had negative consequences for chick growth and pre-fledging mass, which is a proxy for potential juvenile survival. Now, UCT master's student Ryan Ollinger studied breeding forktail drongos in the Kalahari in 2017, and he discovered that drongos were paying a very similar activity cost as temperatures increased. We can see here on the x-axis with the mean air temperature during trial and the y-axis proportion of food items provisioned, there's a strong negative trend as air temperature increased. This led Ryan to believe or to suspect that offspring would suffer consequences of hot days as seen in babblers and hornbills. But this was not the case. Drongo chicks showed no effect of temperature on pre-fledgling mass, here with mean air temperature during nesting period on the x-axis and fledge mass on the y-axis. And this raised the question of how drongos might be able to overcome the costs of breeding in hot conditions. Now Ryan's results raised some interesting questions, and we hypothesize that drongos are able to reduce costs of breeding at hot air temperatures by using mitigatory behavioral strategies. Now, for the purpose of this talk, I would like to focus on one aspect of my research. 
which is provisioning effort in Drongos. And we're trying to answer whether Drongos compensate for reduced provisioning activity at midday by increasing their provisioning at cooler periods, such as morning and evening. And to do this, we use a two-prong approach, which involve observational focals on some Drongos and feeding experiments on others. Starting with focals, this is the classic follow your bird and see what it does. Um, we would follow drongos from less well habituated groups for 30 minutes in the morning, midday and evening and note down the number of provisions to the nest and sometimes species provisioned. And we would do this at different chick ages during the breeding cycles. Looking at the feeding experiments, and here is a very accurate template of what we would do. We are very lucky that we can summon drongos using a vituration call to a perch of our choice. At this perch, we then feed the drongos 20 worms, which are thrown to the drongo at this distance. The drongo flies out, catches the worm, and returns to its perch. And we note down the outcome of this worm, whether it's eaten by the drongo, whether it's provision of the chick, or whether it's the worm was ignored. And we'd run these feeding experiments at the morning, midday, and evening, and note down the total divisions to the nest at different time periods. And we'd obviously do this again at different chick ages um, throughout the breeding cycles. And here I'd like to present some of our findings of the analyses of total number of provisions during the focals with predictive variables on the x-axis and estimates on the y-axis. In these analyses, we explored the effects of scaled maximum daily air temperature interacted with time of day, morning, midday, or evening. Now, effect sizes are compared to what the birds were doing at midday, represented by the dashed line. Now, we can see there is no conclusive evidence of drongos adjusting provisioning patterns according to maximum daily temperature. There is no significant interaction between scaled air temperature with the morning, nor with the evening time period. Neither the interaction differs from midday as days get hotter. Interestingly, drongos uh, maintain a higher provisioning totals in the morning and the evening focals than during the midday, as seen here and here. And this seems to indicate or conform with the classic V pattern that we have in birds of a high morning activity, followed by a low midday activity and a subsequent higher evening activity. Looking at the analysis of the total number of visions during feeding experiments, there's a very different trend that emerges, a very strong interaction between some time periods and air temperature. Here, with maximum daily temperature on the x-axis and total number of provisioned mealworms on the y-axis, we can see that quite clearly, as days get hotter, drongos increase the total number of worms provisioned during the morning compared to midday, with morning in green and midday in red. Interestingly, the total number of items provisioned during the evening here in the blue line did not change significantly regardless of air temperature. So from the result of the provisioning behavior, we can see that both experimental and focal groups provisioned higher totals in the evening compared to midday. And this is not influenced by temperature. However, experimental groups showed an adjustment in temp phase of increasing temperature by increasing morning provisioning effort as days got hotter. And this might be explained by the varying food availability. Our feeding experiments had a fixed food reward 20 mealworms, morning, midday, and evening, whereas in focals, drongos have to um, respond to the natural food availability. But maybe food availability doesn't paint the entire picture. Focals, limited by our eyesight, might be missing an important compensatory time period. We installed infrared camera traps next to drongo nests, and they provide evidence for provisioning during twilight periods, pre-dawn and post-dusk. And we are currently exploring whether activity during this period allows drongos to cope with reduced provisioning during hot days. And this might explain the observed differences in the results obtained. In conclusion, both focal and experimental drongos do not show evidence of complete compensation for the reduced provisioning during midday. However, we are conducting further research on activity during twilight periods and the fitness concerns of this activity to understand how these incredible Kalahari conquerors survive. And on that bombshell, it's time to end. Before I go, I'd like to thank my supervisors, Dr. Sissy Cunningham and Dr. Tom Flower, and those individuals who've helped with field work. And I'd like to thank the institutions for making this work possible. If you have any questions, please email me at the email address above. Otherwise, please stay safe and thank you very, very much for listening. Hello, everyone. My name is Femi. 
I'll be speaking on the basic breeding biology of Africa's smallest raptor, the African pygmy falcons. I guess the name gives it away. These are the rest of the pygmy falcon team. So yes, let's, let's go right into it. I would like to begin by highlighting the ecological importance of this iconic um, ecological structure, the sociable weaver colony. They are built by these dexterous ecological engineers, the sociable weavers. The colony provides shade for animals from the scorching sun in the Kalahari and serve as roosting sites for other avian species. Here we see the scaly feathered weaver roosting in one of the chambers in the colonies. Skinks seek refuge in these colonies and snakes forage in them. And perhaps one very important benefit of these colonies is the ability to buffer the extreme weather conditions in the Kalahari. So we see that the sociable weaver colonies are like a mini ecosystem where species of various taxa congregate and even interact. Unlike other species mentioned in the previous slides, the pygmy falcons are obligate associates of the sociable weaver colonies. They do not build their own nest. They roost and breed in these colonies all year round. They sometimes forage in these colonies. Here we see a predator-prey interaction between two species that are associates of the colonies. The pygmy falcon is having the Kalahari tree skink for lunch. This interaction of direct predation also occurs between the pygmy falcons and their host. We've observed that the pygmy falcons predate on chicks and adult weavers. The falcons also have indirect predatory effects on the weavers. We've observed that sociable weavers alarm and disperse as the falcons approach. This suggests that the presence of the pygmy falcons create a sort of a landscape of fear. Now, both of these direct and indirect predation effects can have severe implications on the population of these ecological engineers. And as such, so much else in the Kalahari that depends on the colonies that they build. But the interaction between the pygmy falcons and the sociable weavers is not all the time negative. The falcons sometimes defend the colonies against snakes. However, very little is known of these very little falcons. Well, in the last couple of years, we've been publishing papers on the different aspects of the pygmy falcons ecology. We've investigated thermal regulation in the falcons, the cooperative breeding propensity in the falcons. We've also looked at how skinks have drop on sociable weavers in order to manage predation by the falcons. But um, the main breeding biology of the pygmy falcons was published in 1970 and this um, study relied on data that was collected in the mid 60s and on a very small sample size but here i present a summary data collected for a period of 10 years between 2011 and 2020 and my data was collected in the northern cape of south africa in swalu kalahari a private game reserve this is our main study area. We survey this area each year for sociable weaver colonies. We try to find the colonies that are occupied by pygmy falcons. So far, we've located more than 300 of these colonies, and these green dots show the distribution in our study area. So how do we find colonies occupied by falcons? Well, to the left of this picture is the underside of the sociable weaver colonies and we can see it has multiple entrances each leading into a unique chamber the falcons mark the entrance of their chamber with their feces which is white in color this somewhat makes it easy for us to identify throughout the study period we've um, located 120 weaver colonies that were occupied by pygmy falcons the blue dots here show the distribution of falcon-occupied colonies in our study area. When we find a falcon-occupied colony, we use a telescopic mirror to check um, inside the chamber. This is how we get to know how many eggs the falcon have laid and whether the eggs have hatched. We ring each falcon in our study population with a unique combination of metal and color rings. This is how we identify each individual in the population. This ring combination is unique to this female falcon and cannot be reassigned to any other individual in our study population. The pygmy falcon nest density in our study area has remained relatively constant. We surveyed between 25 and 66 falcon territories, with an average of 35 falcon territories occupied each season. But 84% of these territories were occupied annually. We detected a total of 323 breeding attempts. 
The earliest attempt was detected in August, but we observed that falcons continue to lay egg even up until February. Most falcons would initiate breeding just once, but some initiate breeding up to three times in one season. This is a breakdown of total breeding attempts per month. For some attempts, we could not determine what month they were initiated. But the peak of egg laying activity was between September and October. So just a quick breakdown of what happened to these 323 breeding attempts. 200 of them were successful. That is, 200 attempts fledged at least one chick from the nest. The outcome of 18 attempts were unknown. And 105 attempts failed. That is, none of these attempts produced any fledglings. So what were the reasons for these failed attempts? Here we see that 50% um, of all failed attempts were due to predation. Um, other events attributed to failure was nest abandonment by falcons. Um, sociable weaver colonies may also collapse, and that means the end of a pygmy falcon's breeding attempt. Um, the reason for 22% of failed attempts were difficult to determine. The falcons in our study area lay between one to three eggs per clutch. For the entire study period, the average clutch size was 2.4 eggs. It takes on average four and a half weeks for an egg to hatch. Um, a nest can hatch between zero to three chicks, averaging a brood size of 2.2. After hatching, the chicks remain in the nest for about five and a half weeks before they eventually fledge. It is at this stage when they fledge that we say a breeding attempt is successful. On average, a nest produced um, two fledglings. Well, I'm currently investigating the variations in these numbers and what environmental factors drive these um, variations. So hopefully I'll be able to give answers in the nearest future. Um, wish me luck and thank you for listening. Um, hi everyone, I'm Cameron Blair and I'm an honours student at the Fitzpatrick Institute uh, working with the Honey Guide Research Project. Um, so the project seeks to understand the remarkable relationship that uh, honey guides have with people and I will be telling you a bit about my research plans um, and also how you can get involved. But uh, first a little bit of background. Um, I'm sure many of you have come across greater honey guides and may have even had the fortune to be guided by one. Uh, these birds are, have a unique mutualistic relationship with humans where they guide the humans to bees nests using uh, this chattering call. The humans then actually smoke out the bees and they open up the nest, allowing the birds to access the wax, which the honey guides can eat. Many honey hunting communities, uh, such as those in northern Mozambique, Tanzania and Kenya, call out to the honey guides as well. Um, the calls given by the honey hunters are variable between the different regions, with some regions giving a, a whistling call, uh, while other regions make a brr hmm uh, sound. Honey guides recognize that this honey hunter's call means that there are humans around that actually want to be guided. Honey guides are brood parasites, which means that they lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. And they parasitize a bunch of different whole nesting birds, um, both on the ground, like bee eaters and kingfishers, or in trees, like hoopoos, barbets, and woodpeckers. Uh, the chicks of the honey guys are brutal, and they kill all of the hosts, um, the host chicks, using their needle sharp hooks on the tip of their bull, as you can see in this photo. Um, they eat as much food as an entire brood of host chicks would, and a single honey guide chick can actually mimic the sound of multiple host chicks. So for my honors project, um, I'm gonna be focusing on the guiding chattering call that is given by adults and fledged juvenile honey guides. So there's this hypothesis that has been proposed by Short and Horn in their book that the guiding call is derived from the begging call of the chicks. Um, and in this hypothesis, the begging call continues to develop into adulthood to form the guiding and so th this hypothesis seems plausible because the guiding call of juvenile birds are rather different to that of adult birds and appear rather twittery and reminiscent of the begging calls and so to test this hypothesis i'll be analyzing recordings 
of the begging calls and guiding calls to see if there are similar notes that are carried over between them. I will use machine learning classification models, which are trained on a subset of the recordings that I have, to identify the type of call that a particular note comes from. So either the begging, the guiding, or the territorial call. And I'll be including the territorial vector calls as a control to compare the results of the begging and the guiding calls to. And if there are similar notes between the begging and the guiding calls, we would expect that these notes would be randomly classified by the model as either a begging or a guiding call. And therefore, the model would misclassify the begging and the guiding calls significantly more frequently um, than the victor calls. In a related question, I'm asking whether there is geographic variation in the guiding call. So what I, I've done is I've collated the guiding calls from across Africa, mainly through the Xenocanto and Macaulay Library. Um, and I'm testing whether the guiding calls from locations nearer to each other are more similar than the guiding calls from locations that are further apart from each other. So if there is evidence for geographic variation, I will also be using the data to explore the evidence for several hypothetical causes of uh, variation. And the first hypothetical cause that I'll consider is the host environment. It is thought that the greater honey guides may exhibit species specific mimicry of the chick begging calls. And if the uh, guiding call is derived from the begging call of the chicks, the species specific mimicry may lead to variation in the guiding call. Secondly, I will be considering the role of the environment in shaping the signal design, and this is known as sensory drive. Greater honey guides occur in a variety of different environments with different degrees of tree cover. And sound attenuates faster in environments with more tree cover. Therefore, variation in the, uh, the guiding call may be due to adaptations to the acoustic conditions. Next, I will be considering whether the presence of honey hunters in an area may impact uh, the variation. In areas where active honey hunting by humans occur, Honey guides are abundant and there may be some geographic isolation as honey guides may be restricted to the areas around villages. If this is so, we would expect to see more variation between populations in areas where there are active honey hunters. Lastly, variation could arise from random ge genetic drift over time across the large range of the greater honey guides. Each of these hypotheses have certain predictions for how the guiding calls and the vector calls vary throughout the range of the honey guides. And I can therefore find evidence against some of the hypotheses to exclude them and find the most likely hypothesis. So why am I doing this? Well, the guiding behavior appears to be lost in some regions and understanding the development and the evolution of the guiding behavior helps us understand what is driving this loss. My research seeks to understand the origins and the sources of variation in the guiding call, which gives us insights into the development of the guiding behavior. This will also potentially be a case study where a feature developed for an antagonistic interaction between species, the mimetic begging calls in the brood parasitism interaction, can be co-opted for the use in a cooperative interaction, um, namely the guiding call used in human mutualism. Lastly, I invite you to help me in collecting recordings for any greater honey guide calls. Um, I'm looking for any calls I can get my hands on as I'm wanting to have a good sample size and cover as much geographic area as possible. I also want to invite you to participate in the honeyguiding.me citizen science project, where the honey guide project team is collecting details of any sightings of greater honey guides, whether they are guiding or not. We invite you to visit the website to submit any recordings or sightings that you may have and to find out more about the project. Uh, that's it from me. Thanks to all of those that have contributed recordings so far. Pietro for his bioacoustic help and the rest of the Honey Guide team, particularly Claire and Jessica, uh, my fantastic supervisors. Hi everyone, my name is Uluad Nunsia Adekola. I'm a PhD student at the Fitzpatrick Institute of Public Ontology, University of Cape Town. And my research focuses on mode patterns and feather quality in seabirds and raptors. Today I'll be telling you one of the most fascinating and important parts of avian life, which is moats. And for the purpose of this presentation, 
I will focus on the extent and symmetry of tail moat in armor vacuums. Moat is one of the three major and energy demanding activities in the annual cycle of birds. It is simply the replacement of old feathers with new ones. Unlike breeding and migration, all birds, including passerines, young birds, flightless birds, and flying seabirds, need to replace their feathers regularly. And monitoring how different birds moat and how this changes over time might be a way to track individual and population health. Interestingly, moat extent and symmetry have been proposed as a predictor of fitness in birds. Therefore, understanding the strategies that birds use to moat is important for their conservation. Adult falcons typically moat their flight feathers in one moat cycle, which is within one year, but the timing and extent of juvenile flight feather moat varies considerably among species. For example, sooty falcons, a long distance migrant, replace all their flight feathers in their first winter. However, juvenile of other long distance migrant falcons do not moat their flight feathers on their wintering ground. Russian hobbies and Hela and other falcons undergo a similar migration to Sooty falcon, yet only moat in their second summer. Other migratory species, such as lesser kestre and red footed falcon, only moat a variable number of tail feathers or on their wintering grounds, retaining all juvenile primaries and secondaries. We explore extent and symmetry of flight feather moat in animal falcons. We also test whether moat extent is related to body condition in animal falcons. The animal falcons undergo one of the most extreme migration of any raptor, crossing the Indian Ocean between the Asian breeding grounds and non-breeding areas in Southern Africa. We score moat from almost 2,000 adult and juvenile animal falcons killed at their roost during two hail storms in KwaZulu Natal, South Africa, in March 2019. One of the events at Mo River on 9 March and another at Newcastle on 21st of March. The two mass mortality events affected almost 4,000 Amor Falcons. We recorded more males than females across events and ages, except in juveniles during the first event where we recorded more females than males. Male biased adult sex ratio is common across many bird species, particularly in trained species. The number of tail feathers replaced in adult was bimoda, with no birds having replaced six to seven tail feathers. We termed those that are moated the zero to five feathers as late tail motors and those that have that had replaced eight to twelve feathers as early tail motors surprisingly we found that adults killed on the first event had moated more tail feathers than those killed 12 days later we think that the bimodality of adult tail moat is traceable to the late motors being second year birds and their proportion could be higher in the second event if some had already departed KwaZulu Natal by 23rd of March. Juvenile male armor falcons showed increasing progression of body moths into adult male plumage from stage 1 to stage 4. We also showed a positive relationship between extent of tail moths and body moths in juvenile males. In other words, as body moths increases, extent of tail moths also increases. There was strong selection for symmetry across tail feathers. Tail moat was more symmetrical in adults than juveniles. The central feathers, which is the T1, had lowest symmetry in adults and shared the lowest symmetry with T2 in juvenile armor falcons. The greater symmetry among juvenile tail moats might indicate selection for birds with greater symmetry. Moat typically started with the central tail feathers in both adults and juveniles. However, adults were more likely to have replaced their other tail feathers than juveniles. We found variation in the sequence of tail moat, with most birds either moulting outward or inward. Outward moat is when moat starts at the center and proceeds outward, while inward moat is when moat starts from the outer tail feathers and proceeds inward. 
In adults, 67% were emoting outward and 24% were emoting inward. While in juveniles, 97% were emoting outward and 1% inward. This variation in mood sequence may suggest mood plasticity and may be an adaptive response to the problem of optimal timing of mood of different feathers within the same feather tracts. The extent of tail mood correlated with body condition in both juveniles and adults, which means that birds with better body condition tended to moat more tail feathers, suggesting that moat patterns might be used as an indicator of fitness in falcons. On a final note, despite the reverse sexual dimorphism that has been reported in most birds of prey, that is females larger than males, we found that male armor falcon have longer tassels length than females in both juveniles and adults. This unexpected finding may be related to a more area hunting pattern in males possibly related to provisioning during the breeding period. In conclusion, moat is an important process in avian animal cycle. Moat pattern might be used as an indicator of fitness in falcons. Why juvenile falcons would replace tail feathers rather than similarly more important outer primaries is unclear. Further study is needed to investigate the causes and consequences of the various tail moat strategies found in hormone patterns. This research has already been published in the Journal of Ornithology. You can check it out for more information. I would love to acknowledge the following organizations and thank you so much for your attention. Good day everyone. I'm Andrew McKechnie, a professor of zoology at the University of Pretoria and the holder of the South African Research Chair in Conservation Physiology at Sanby. I'm going to be talking today about bird deaths on an extremely hot day in early November last year in northern KwaZulu-Natal, which as far as I can tell is the first major heat-related mortality event involving non-domesticated birds reported in Southern Africa. I'll start by providing some historical context before looking in detail at the events of the day in question. I'll then finish off by placing these events into the context of the warming anticipated for the rest of the century. Birds dying in large numbers on extremely hot days have been reported in several parts of the world over the last century, including the American Southwest and India. But the epicenter for these events has been Australia, and I'm going to provide a brief timeline for that continent to provide some context for the Pongola event. In January, in January 1932, an event that can be best be described as cataclysmic unfolded in this area that you can see on the map, which is roughly equivalent in surface area to the Northern Cape and Free State provinces combined. Multiple accounts of mortality on a vast scale were sent to the local ornithological journal, and together they paint a picture of deaths numbering into the millions. This is by far the worst avian mortality event during extreme heat that I've ever heard of. Then, moving forward to the last decade, January 2009 saw thousands of budgies and a handful of other species dying during three consecutive days above 45 degrees at a roadhouse 500 kilometers north of Perth. A year later, a single day of 47 in between much cooler weather wiped out at least 208 Carnaby's black cockatoos, a species red-listed as endangered. At some breeding sites, 50% of breeding adult cockatoos perished in a matter of hours. With that brief Australian timeline to provide some context, we can now move closer to home, specifically the town of Pongola in uh, northern KwaZulu-Natal on the 8th of November last year. This lower graph shows the maximum air temperatures during the first half of the month. After several days of air temperatures in the upper 30s, on the 8th, temperatures spiked all the way up to 43 degrees. This top figure shows an hourly trace of air temperature in Pongola on the 8th, and the dashed line here indicates relative humidity. What's important to notice here is that air temperature exceeded 40 by about 11 o'clock in the morning, and then remained above 40 until about four o'clock in the afternoon. I should also mention that we've just published a paper describing these events in the journal Austral Ecology, and that's the reference that you can see at the bottom left of the screen. On the same day, the thermometer at the offices in Pongolo Nature Reserve 
registered 45 degrees and the reserve staff started noticing dead and dying birds. After the worst of the heat, field rangers searched an area of approximately 45 hectares and found 44 carcasses belonging to 14 species. The area the rangers searched was equivalent to just 1% of the reserve, so the 44 casualties were very likely only a small fraction of the total. What's also relevant for reasons that I'll mention in a few slides time is that all of the deaths, sorry, nearly all of the deaths were passerines, with just three exceptions, including the cardinal woodpecker you can see in the photograph at the lower left. In the weeks following this event, we were in contact with several folks in the area and collated all the information we could find. This figure from our paper shows locations for which we have weather data or reports of dead birds or bats. The weather data are not particularly clear, so I've, I've highlighted them in red. And at all the sites for which we have weather data, maximum air temperature on the 8th was somewhere between 43 and 45.1 degrees Celsius, and relative humidity at the hottest time of the day, 21 to 23%. In terms of the species affected, um, most of the deaths occurred in Pongolo Nature Reserve, with one swift in Pongola Town. The major bat mortality occurred in Pongola Town as well, where approximately 50 Wahlberg's epauletted fruit bats succumbed to the heat. One of the questions that came up while we were collating this information was whether the deaths were in fact caused directly by heat, or whether other factors such as disease or poison could have been involved. We do not believe that anything other than direct effects of heat were involved for three reasons. First of all, the deaths occurred in both, both birds and mammals at multiple sites up to 90 kilometers apart during the hottest time of day on a single day, the 8th of November. Even where birds did not die, drinking behavior was very unusual um, and included species that almost never drink. The second reason is that in terms of the, the bat mortalities, the conditions on the 8th were very similar to those associated with flying fox deaths on the Australian East Coast, which also typically start at air temperatures above 42 and similar humidities um, to what, what occurred in KZN. The third reason concerns the fact that almost all the victims were passerines. Birds have several different avenues for dissipating heat during very hot conditions by evaporation but passerines are reliant on panting, the least efficient of these pathways. So a priori, we would expect passerines to be the most vulnerable group of birds during an extreme heat event like this. That brings me to the end of the talk, where we take a quick look into the future. We all know Earth is heating rapidly, and the mainstream projections are for average global temperatures around 4 degrees hotter by the end of the century. But a point that often gets overlooked is the magnitude of warming that's already taken place. These are data for Skakuza over the last 70 years, showing the number of days per year hotter than 40. Now we've just seen what can happen on a single day above 40 in a part of the country that is climatically very similar to Skakuza, and I think the alarm bells really should be ringing loudly at this point. As the number of extremely hot days increases, so too does the risk of truly catastrophic mortality events. Finally, I would like to acknowledge these organizations that have made the Hot Birds Research Project possible over the last 12 years. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Susan Miller. I'm a postdoc at the Phipps. Today I'm going to talk to you about Cape sugarbirds and whether they are ready for climate change. This will be using insights from genetics and parasite infections. First, just a little bit of background about sugarbirds, in case you're not familiar with this charismatic species. They are found in the Thainbos, which is shown in green here on the map of South Africa. And if we now add in the Sabab 2, so the Atlas data for the sugarbirds, you can see all of these yellow to red squares represent the range of the sugarbirds. So you can see they are completely constrained to the Thainbos. This means they are endemic to the Thainbos because they need the Thainbos to survive. The reason they need to live in the Thainbos is that they are nectivores. This means they eat nectar from flowers, and they are primarily dependent on flowering proteas and leucosperms, which are only found in the Thainbos. So basically, the sugar birds follow the flowers around the Thainbos. Thainbos vegetation is driven by fire. 
Without fire, there would be no succession of the various different plants. For instance, the protea flowers on which the sugar birds are highly dependent only start flowering about five, four years after a fire. With climate change, fire regimes are predicted to change and this may well then impact on the sugar birds and their food source. We know that when there is a fire, sugar birds will move from an area of fire into an unburnt area. What we're not so sure about is whether this happens in a small area of Fainboss and we have discrete populations across their range, or if sugar birds are one large population that's connected and the birds move freely within their entire range. So in this study, we use genetics of the sugar birds and also parasite prevalence and strains to explore this structure. The first part of this work was actually done by the master's student, Campbell Fleming, and he looked at the genetics of the sugar birds. And what he found was that there was no population structure within the sugar birds based on their genetics. This map just shows a representation of this, one of the analysis techniques. Each of the circles that you can see here represents a sampling site, and then the lines between the sites represent individuals that are quite related to one another. This doesn't mean they're directly related, just at the genetic level, they are similar in a genetic makeup. And as you can see by the lines that go all crisscrossing across the country, these birds are highly related to one another throughout their range. The second method that we used to look at the population structure of the sugar birds was actually to look at the parasites that we were able to detect within their blood. Using the same blood samples that Campbell used for his genetics work, we were able to use tests to determine the presence and then the strain of the parasites within the sugar birds. On this map, the pie charts represent the different sites that were sampled. The larger the pie, the more birds were sampled at that site. White indicates that the birds were uninfected, whereas the different colors represent the different strains of the parasite that we were able to detect. So for an instance, at this site, about half the birds we sampled were infected, and of the ones that were infected, the majority of them were infected with this strain that's represented by the dark blue. This color, this strain was the most prevalent strain we found across the country, but interestingly, we did find it everywhere in the country. It's a bit hard to see, but there is a little sliver of blue in this most Eastern population that we sampled. Similarly, this orange strain, which is the second most common, was found in this most eastern quite a lot in this middle cluster and some out on the western coast. So what this tells us is that the strains were spread across the country and that the prevalence or the infection rate was also fairly consistent across the country. This all helps support the hypothesis that the Cape sugar bird is one large connected population. So by combining the genetic and the parasite work, we were able to conclude that the Cape sugar bird population appears to be one connected population across their entire range. So what does this mean for Cape sugar birds and climate change? Well, basically, as the Cape sugar birds are one large population and they are able to move around to follow their food, they are in the best shape possible to be able to adjust to other changes that climate change may bring. What we are not so sure about is how the fame boss will respond. There are indications that fire frequency is changing in response to climate change. We already know that the, some of the proteas are flowering earlier than they used to. What this will mean for sugar birds, we will have to wait and see. More research into the impacts of climate change on fainbus would be useful to help us understand the impacts of this on sugar birds and everything else within the bio. Thank you to everyone that's been involved in this project, and thank you for listening, and happy birthday. My name is Stefan Skumbi. I'm a PhD student at, with the Fitzpatrick Institute at the University of Cape Town. For the last eight years, I've been researching seabirds breeding in the Southern Ocean, with particular focus on albatrosses that breed on Marion Island, which is halfway between South Africa and Antarctica. Seabirds breeding in the Southern Ocean have an incredible range um, and they have to travel vast distances to provide food for their chicks. So they travel from relatively safe breeding sites um, around the whole Southern Ocean. They do this using uh, energy efficient flight mode called dynamic soaring, 
where they take advantage of the prevailing winds um, that the Southern Ocean is famous for, um, roaring 40s, 50s, and so on. In the past, the studies of seabirds is mainly done uh, through visual observation from ship decks. Um, or when loggers were used, it was quite ethically questionable. And these days, electronics are much smaller and we can take advantage of that for biology. So we can fit really small tags that record large amounts of data and last much longer than they did before on a wide range of um, animals. So we can even put cameras now on small um, seabirds. So this is exactly what I did. I fitted cameras, um, inertial measurement units, and GPSs to uh, a range of seabirds breeding in the Southern Ocean. Now these um, inertial measurement units are similar to what is in most cell phones these days and fitness trackers and so on. So we can track the exact movement of the birds. So I could see exactly what they were doing from takeoff all the way to um, the distant foraging grounds. So here I have a bird taking off from Marion Island. And you can see initially it's quite, quite a rough takeoff. And then as soon as they hit the water, it becomes a bit smoother um, as they start the dynamic soaring. Here we have a bird flying in very calm conditions uh, into the sunset. And as soon as the wind starts picking up, waves become larger, we see the typical dynamic soaring cycles. Now to quantify this, I had to turn to computer vision. So I wrote software that automatically extracted the horizon from each video frame. And I could then use the horizon to infer the body angle. So the bank angle of the birds as they're making their turns um, with, within the dynamic soaring cycle. Um, so this just illustrates the process. Here we have an illustration of a dynamic soaring cycle where birds firstly turn into the wind, gaining altitude before turning with the wind, uh, gaining speed, um, and then before returning back into, into the cycle again. And now the data that I collected enabled me to quantify um, how the birds are doing this in various wind conditions. So some of the interesting results was that I could clearly see that the birds compensated for varying wind patterns by altering their bank angles. Um, so this is a typical trip in the Southern Ocean of albatross, um, calling these looping trips where the birds move from Marion Island, which is indicated by a star, moving north and coming back, um, and all within mostly prevailing westerly winds, so uh, wind moving from the west to the east. Um, so we could see in the, from the bank angle data that the birds on the outbound trips favored banking towards the left, so turning into the wind, and then on the return trips favored banking right, still turning into the wind. Surprisingly, I also saw a lot of flapping. Uh, albatrosses are known for their dynamic soaring, but yeah, I also saw that they were um, performing a lot of flapping in light winds. And it's also evident from the video data, the birds flap to gain altitude. Um, in stronger winds, flapping was less, almost no flapping. Um, and you can see this by much steeper bank angles, um, and more regular uh, dynamic soaring cycles as they take advantage of the wind. Now, these results are particularly interesting as the wind patterns in the Southern Ocean is changing as a result of climate change. So the prevailing winds are getting stronger and moving poleward. And this has consequences for the distribution of the birds um, as they rely on the wind the mode of travel. Another interesting thing we can see from the video data is interaction um, the birds have with each other at feeding sites. And this is something that still needs to be explored. And from the video data, it's quite interesting shots where birds are interacting. 
Thank you for watching. What an incredible amount of science taking place by so many bright young minds. A massive thank you to the Fitzpatrick team for sharing their work with us. Up next, we will have the privilege of hearing Dr. Hazel Thompson's insights and reflections into the conservation of Africa's birds over the past 20 years. Hazel will commence his lecture at 10.30. While you wait, why not head over to the exhibitor booths or place your bid in our silent auctions? Just click on the menu to the left of your screen to navigate to your desired destination. Stay tuned, everyone. <laughs>